Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Dr. Paul Myers and I'm the Director of Research and Development at the Readiness and Emergency Management for Schools Technical Assistance Center, also known as the TA Center, which is administered by the U.S. Department of Education's Office of Safe and Healthy Students, or OSHS. I'd like you to welcome you to the webinar, Reunification After a Community-Wide Disaster, Planning Tools for Schools. During today's event, presenters from the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, or NICMIC, OSHS, and the REMS TA Center will discuss issues related to minors being separated from their parents or legal guardians after a large emergency or disaster, planning for reunification, and resources that schools, school districts, and their community partners can use to facilitate reunification. Participants will have an opportunity to pose questions to today's presenters in a question and answer session that immediately follows the presentation section of the webinar, and also in a REM CA Center Community of Practice, or COP, chat after the event. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the TA Center's website via our webinars page, along with an accompanying resource guide following this event. Links to both the webinars page and the COP are available in the web links box on your screen. Before we start, we have a few brief housekeeping items to cover. We'll reference several resources throughout this webinar. These items, as well as the descriptions of them and their URLs, are provided in the resource list in the handouts box on your screen. As a reminder, there's no dial-in for this webinar. Audio is available, available via the link provided. If you're experiencing difficulty hearing the audio stream, please turn up your computer speaker volume at this time. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please contact the TA Center at info at remstacenter.org. You may also request technical assistance using the Q&A tool on your screen. Questions are viewable to the, moderator web, to the webinar, webinar moderator only. To ask a question during the webinar, use the Q&A tool on your screen to send your message to the facilitator. You may post questions at any time during the webinar, although they'll be answered as time permits following the presentation. If you would like to submit a question and are not able to do so via the box provided on your screen, or if you'd like to send us a question after the event, please email your questions again to info at remstacenter.org. I'd like to briefly introduce the presenters for today's webinar. The full bios are available in the handouts box on your screen. Cindy Atkins is an emergency manager for FEMA headquarters mass care team. As FEMA's reunification lead, Cindy supports local, state, tribal, and national efforts to develop a whole community approach to planning for reunification needs that are, arise as a result of a disaster or emergency. Sharon Hauer is the manager of emergency preparedness in response to the NICMIC. Sharon works to increase awareness regarding the importance of effectively planning for the management, care, and protection of children in disasters among local, state, federal, and tribal stakeholders around the U.S. She also manages the readiness and response capabilities of NICMIC during a disaster. We'll now take a moment to review the agenda. Malin Sullivan from EDS OSHS and I will first provide a brief overview of planning for post-disaster reunification. Cindy and Sharon will then share information on some of the challenges in post-disaster reunification, how to address them, and reunification resources that communities and you can use. We'll close the webinar with our Q&A session, and after the webinar, please join us on the community of practice to ask additional questions about this topic and to continue the conversation. I'm now going to hand things over to Madeline, who is a management and program analyst in EDS OSHS. She serves as the contracting officer's representative for the REMS TA Center. Prior to joining the federal government workforce, she provided technical assistance on pro-social skill development, violence prevention, and school emergency management after having served as a special educator. So Madeline, over to you. Thank you, everyone. To kick things off, um, I'd like to introduce us to the top. This webinar will focus on reunification after an emergency that affects not only the school, but also the whole community. 
This is commonly referred to as um, post-disaster reunification. Post-disaster reunification differs from family reunification at school with an emphasis on the word family. That occurs after an emergency that affects just the school, such as a building fire. So when considering community-wide uh, disasters where post-disaster reunification becomes important, many of us think back to catastrophic disasters like Hurricane Katrina, where entire regions of the country were affected and children were separated from their families and sometimes for a very long time. Events like these certainly require post-disaster reunification efforts. However, schools and school districts may also be called on to assist in post-disaster reunification after other types of um, incidents with differing impact areas, such as an earthquake, a flood, or a tornado. During these types of events, children may be alone or with someone other than their primary caregiver, and they can be separated from their families. In some cases, children may even be with their families during the event, but unintentionally separated from their families later. And occasionally, children may be the only surviving family members in disasters involving mass casualties. But the good news is that there's already a great deal of plans and resources and systems in place to help with reunification, many of which you're going to hear about today. For the school or the school district planning team, it's just a matter of putting the jigsaw pieces together to come up with a few extra protocols and systems that best meet the needs of that community, its schools, and its children and youth. Okay, so following a large disaster or emergency, it may take a few days or longer to reunite a child with their family because of factors that may include communication challenges with legal guardians, custodial disputes such as those um, that require evidence of legal guardianship that may have been destroyed in the disaster, the inability to track or locate children or their family, possibly because of the lack of a registration process or even a tracking tool. Then there's um, the, the possibility of a deceased legal guardian, a wandering child or abduction of a child, and long distance displacement that results in the transfer of people out to out-of-state shelters. So this task of reuniting children with their families after a community-wide disaster, it's, it's important for schools to consider. So while we have lots of warning signs for some hazards, such as a hurricane, that's going to allow the school to close before the event, there's other hazards to consider, such as an earthquake or even those ones that are caused by humans that are going to affect the school or its program while it's open. This risk of trauma or danger experienced by children increases with the time that they remain separated from their family. And we know that separated children may also be exposed to, to a lot of additional dangers, such as assault, abduction, and exploitation. So schools are often one of the best and most trusted sources of information for families, which in turn is going to get passed to other members of the community. OK, so planning for post-disaster reunification is unique for schools and school districts. Instead of the educational officials taking the lead on planning for this type of event um, and function, the school team is likely going to be part of a larger city, county, or jurisdictional team that is addressing this topic of reunification. And just like school EOPs, the local reunification plans are integrated with regional, state, territory reunification plans. And these, in turn, are integrated with federal plans. This facilitates that seamless expansion of resources. So to prepare for post-disaster reunification, planning teams will need to determine what the school's role is in supporting that community 
and what their internal protocols will be. So there's two key roles that schools might take on. One is being that voice for children. As you're going to hear later on in the presentation, children and youth, they make up such a sizable portion of the population. But unfortunately, their needs are not always addressed in emergency plans to the same extent as those of adults. And schools have a great deal of experience and expertise <laughs> for caring for and addressing the needs of children and youth before, during, and after an emergency. Another role might be that of serving as the conduit of information. So schools continue to be a trusted agent during emergencies. And schools are often relied upon for, for information and support from both the families in the community as well as the responders. So for example, community partners might reach out to schools for records um, to help identify a legal guardian or how to reach them and even how to help identify those children and youth who are separated from their families. And likewise, families may feel um, comfortable reaching out to the school or they have that established relationship with school officials that they know and trust. So they might be reaching out to the schools to get information. And also, schools might be able to help relay some of that critical information um, to families and the partners to so serve as more of a bridge or a conduit. OK. So as the school and the school district planning teams collaborate with the local planning teams, its members can advocate for other local child-focused and youth-focused groups to provide input to determine how post-disaster reunification can be coordinated and integrated throughout the community. So groups that the planning team are, are likely going to want to uh, consult with are families, including some students, school educators, school administrators, and school staff, including, including folks like um, persons from the transportation department, uh, student health, and even the cafeteria. First responders, including law enforcement, fire department, and emergency medical services, particularly those that collaborate on an ongoing basis with the school and have responsibilities in school safety. And then child focus groups such as the Boys and Girls Club or other before and after school programs. There are important state and local health care providers such as the public health departments and the hospitals, EMS um, service providers and pediatricians to consider and to um, work with. And then even um, entities such as the local, child, local and state child welfare agencies, Department of Social Services or Human Services, Children and Family Services as well. And of course, um, the local emergency managers. So later on in the planning process, what we often refer to as step five, these school protocols would be shared with all the members in the planning groups, as well as um, also shared the, defined, um, clear, the clearly defined roles and responsibilities. As the school or school district planning team develops its own protocols, they can use the six-step planning process um, to address the, this community reunification. So as folks know, the six-step planning process was put together jointly by, um, by Department of Education, Department of Justice, its Federal Bureau of Investigation, Homeland Security, and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, along with Health and Human Services. So this planning process, it's very flexible and it's adaptable. And it can be used to review, revise, or create um, an EOP or even just a functional annex, such as community reunification. But what's important that by using this process together with the community partners, everything gets integrated um, at the local, state, and national levels. And then, as you can see, um, step one is forming the collaborative planning team, which we just discussed. And step two is understanding the situation. So there's going to be steps you take before to understand the resources and the plans for better integration and better preparedness. 
and you're going to have in place and be ready to use some tools during an emergency to better be able to assess and identify the needs of these children and youth who might be separated from their families, and likewise after. With steps three and four, the team is typically developing those goals and objectives and the more specific courses of action. And step five, folks write the plan, review, and agree upon it. And step six is they teach the community. They inform and work with the community so everybody knows their roles and responsibilities in the event of an emergency. So um, folks are mo most likely well aware of this process, especially at the community level, since it was um, modeled after the six-step process that's put forth in CPG 101 or the Compre um, Comprehensive Preparedness Guide 101. And this is the typical guidance that emergency managers use for the community. And so we adapted it in collaboration with the other agencies to make it specific for schools. So it's likely nothing um, very new for partners. So as the school planning team develops these goals and objectives and courses of action for their own EOPs, they might want to consider addressing um, activities before, during, and after an event. And then um, they also want to be using those five mission areas to help inform um, their planning and the development of activities. So for example, when we talk about preparedness, we're talking about prevention, protection, mitigation, response, and recovery. Together, as, as planning teams and as actual communities build their capacity in each of these mission areas, they are building preparedness. Similarly, as we build school preparedness, we are building community preparedness. And when we are building community preparedness and addressing those very unique needs of children and youth, we are also um, building school preparedness. Some of the common principles to keep in mind are um, using this paradigm of um, all settings, all times. So let's remember when we're thinking about how to put in place for unification protocols that we're thinking about before and after school times, including after school programs or maybe even weekend activities. We're going to be thinking about those field trips. Um, and then also we're going to be thinking about athletic events that take place at the opponent's home or even study abroad programs. And most importantly, we're going to be thinking about those typical access and functional needs of, of children and youth, including those with disabilities and special needs, but also remembering the very particular special needs of children and youth and applying those and integrating those along the way. So unless there are state or local requirements, schools and school district planning teams can ultimately decide the format and content of their EOPs, including the functional annexes that address cross-cutting functions, um, such as reunification. Typically, however, schools and school districts will include a family reunification annex in their EOP, and the planning team will also then need to decide um, where their school-specific protocols that address post-disaster reunification will be included, and perhaps even in a separate annex. But of course, they will be properly integrated with that of the communities. Okay, so two recurring themes that you're going to hear um, today from both myself with the Office of Safe and Healthy Students, the REMS TA Center team, and our partners at FEMA um, are, is that need to train and participate in exercises. It's really important to remember this part. So once you've developed your procedures, um, we want to think about um, how to bring these to life and really practice them. So work with your external partners, such as the emergency managers, who might not be familiar with some of the reunification processes and tools that you'll be hearing about today and we'll be highlighting. And then also even the, the, your local municipalities protocols. So you might need to share them with them. And that could include being um, providing the link to the archived version of this webinar if you think it would help inspire and um, give some um, powerful strategies for developing your own. 
And then also keep in mind those internal stakeholders, such as your planning team and administrators, who need to be aware of the processes for reunification. They don't necessarily need to know all of the processes and details, but they should be familiar with some of the basic concepts and where to go for more information. Representatives from your school should also be participating in community level disaster exercises when possible. While there may be exercises focused solely on reunification, it's possible that reunification activities might be incorporated into larger exercises that are focused on other functions, um, such as a community recovery. In these instances, instances, a representative of the school or school district can join the planning meetings for the event, as well as participate in the exercise. Finally, schools and school districts can help uh, promote preparedness to their families, which can help reunification after an emergency and promote preparedness amongst the whole community. So this includes pointing parents and guardians to resources um, that will help them learn their roles and responsibilities during response and recovery. And then also other resources, such as FEMA's Make a Plan webpage, so this uh, web page is listed in the resource guide, and it includes information and resources on how to create a family plan and address the specific needs of family members and create a written plan and practice that plan um, with the household. So for example, um, our colleague Paul um, shares with us a lot of stories about how his family um, addresses this. And their plan includes um, identifying out-of-state contacts and um, in the case the local telephone lines and internet are not operable. And so for him, he's got um, contacts uh, in different areas of the, of the nation, and they all know who to contact and when and how um, if they are in the midst of a disaster. Another great resource, especially if you have young children, um, is to have a backpack emergency cart. So this is important for families to consider, but it's also a great opportunity for the schools to um, find ways to promote the same aim. So when we see um, folks using backpack emergency cards, that card typically includes the child and the parents, parents or guardians information, such as their emergency contacts. And then there's a number of organizations that have um, done this or similar activities. And they're available for free, both for individual families to use or even schools to help make available uh, to families. So we've also included links to a few of them in our resource guide. A popular one is provided by the Centers for Disease Control, and you're looking at that right now on your screen. And then there are some other ones that are put forth um, as part of Red Cross and Save the Children. And then, um, so we also highly recommend that schools can take the lead in helping to promote this very, um, sim or very easy activity that will go a long way in helping to protect children before, during, and after. Great. Thank you, Madeline. I'm now going to hand the presentation over to Cindy and Sharon. So uh, Sharon, over to you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to present here with you today. Um, what we're going to talk about today is just some of the different challenges that, is, that are associated with uh, disaster reunification, um, the tools and resources that are available, especially in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, which Madeline was talking about, where we learned a lot about separation of children from their families in the aftermath of a disaster. So there's been, there's been a great effort to try and put together resources and tools to help local jurisdictions and states and school entities um, really plan for reunification as it occurs in their, uh, in their locations. So I wanted to just kind of start out by sharing some statistics. I know that um, Madeline was talking about um, planning for children and how different it is than planning for the general population. And a good majority of that is because children are considered among the most vulnerable. 
So in a disaster, they are made even more vulnerable, um, especially when they're separated from their legal guardians and parents. Um, so when we're planning for them, we really shouldn't plan for them as if they're small adults. Um, they think differently than, than adults. They're anatomically different. They, they're psychologically different in how they react to things. So it's really important to keep those facts to, um, when, when we're starting to do our, our reunification plans. Children make up about a quarter of the nation's population. So on a typical weekday, you're going to see upwards of almost 70 million children in schools and child care across the country, which is a pretty large number when you start to think about uh, an event that can impact multiple states, such as an earthquake or a no-notice event where we don't have the luxury of time to plan for it or to close schools down where children may be at school or may be at child care their parents are maybe at work or at home um, when the event happens. And so that becomes a much bigger um, concern, especially for school officials, um, as the children need to be reunified with their parents as soon as possible. Katrina taught us a lot about the separation of children from their uh, family members. And so when we kind of broke down looking at the different classifications, we saw that it wasn't just about missing children. We, so missing children obviously is, is uh, a person younger than the age of 18 whose whereabouts are unknown to their legal guardian. But we also saw two different two additional classifications. So we had a separated child who technically means the child was given by the parents to another trusted adult, maybe a relative, a teacher, a family member, a godparent, a friend, um, so that the, that that individual can care for the child until they could all be reunified. Um, so the child's in good hands with someone who's trusted, but they're still not with their family members or, or legal guardian. Um, and then we have the unaccompanied child, which is what y you guys in the school uh, arena tend to see. So the child is found, the parents are, are lost. So we don't know where the parents are, but the child now is under our care. And we've got to manage the care of that child in certain circumstances. Um, if it's a child who's not from that area, um, some officials may have to identify the child if the child cannot self-identify and then also work on the reunification. So the unaccompanied piece um, becomes a much larger challenge in a disaster, uh, especially when there's no reunification plans in place, which is what we're trying to encourage. Um, I know that Katrina, when we're talking about Hurricane Katrina, it happened such a long time ago, but I think it's an important thing to continue to talk about because it taught us so much about how this could happen. And if we think about how important it is to talk about it, hurricanes, I think Madeline said it a little earlier, hurricanes are a notice event, so we had the luxury of time to close down schools. We had the luxury of time to, to message out to family members so that they stay intact. So the separation is very uh, is decreased, um, and there are limited challenges that are associated to reunification other than people from outside of the impacted area worried about the people inside the impacted area. But Katrina was one of those notice events. We had the luxury of time to be able to plan for it, and we still saw a great deal of children who were separated from their family members during this type of an event. So we wanted to try and understand what that looked like. So we had 1.5 million people evacuating, and 200,000 of those people were children. And we saw a lot of the separation happening during the evacuation phase. So there wasn't a coordinated evacuation of, uh, of the area. And so when there were buses that were finally available to get people out of the impact area, um, th there was no coordinated mechanism to get people on buses. So it wasn't like when you're boarding a plane, children with uh, um, families with children can board first. It was literally everyone just trying to get on the bus at the same time. So you had children who were swept onto buses by you know the rush of the crowd trying to get on the bus um, and parents going on another bus and no one was collecting information so you had two different buses heading in two different directions with no idea that there was an unaccompanied child on that bus. We also saw the same thing happen during the rescue phase where there were people that were trapped on their rooftops awaiting rescue by helicopter or boat. And oftentimes those, those vessels only had room for maybe one or two people and parents being you know, concerned for their, for their children would always hand over their child first. 
Um, and unfortunately, it would delay the reunification because uh, another helicopter or boat wouldn't be available for several hours. Um, so again, no one's collecting information as they're putting that child onto the boat or onto the helicopter. They're just, their primary mission is to get them to safe ground. Um, so we saw a lot of separation happening. And we had a lot of children who were, uh, ended up being taken to general population disaster shelters. And if you remember the news from that time, we're talking about shelters that had a population of 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 people. So imagine being a small child in that kind of uh, facility. It could be rather scary. And, and Madeline also alluded to the fact that they're exposed to so many endangerments. Um, if they're separated and they're in an unknown environment with unknown, an unknown population and no one supervising their care, um, they're very susceptible. So the Department of Children and Family Services for the state of Louisiana um, was tasked with um, putting together a plan to try and uh, remove these children, these unaccompanied children from these general population shelters and move them to a safe location so that uh, the state could begin working on their reunification with their family members. So they just decided to uh, activate an unaccompanied minor shelter. And so they had, uh, it was run by Child Protective Services and the state, Depart the state uh, sheriff's office. Um, and they had a number of different entities there working on trying to identify these children, take photos of these children, um, and also, uh, you know, to try to reunify them as quickly as possible. And what we notice is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis at the National Center is that photos are the quickest way to locate the missing. So we would try to get a photograph of the child. Um, if the parents were calling to report the child missing, we would try to get uh, an updated photograph of that child from the parents, and we would put it on posters and plastered around um, the area that the child either went missing or an area that we thought maybe the child traveled to, um, so that people who may be in that area could find that child. Well, all said and done, the National Center was activated to help support um, the disaster and help support the, uh, the Department of Children and Family Services and we helped to resolve and reunite over 5,000 cases of displaced children. And that's a large number, and I don't want to make it seem like there were 5,000 individual children who were separated um, during Katrina. A lot of that was duplication, and, and a, a good majority of the duplication were misspelling of names. And you don't really know that they're duplications until you run that information down. So it's really important. Um, to be able to create an, a, a, a solid intake or an effective intake process that will minimize that duplication. A lot of the um, cases that we also act, that we also received were of children who may have run away prior to the disaster but were only being reported after uh, Katrina. So it was really important to kind of run all of that information down. And so we had to open up over 5,000 cases to make sure that um, none of these, uh, that, that all of these were um, cases that we could resolve. The last child was reunited with her family uh, in Texas seven months after landfall. So it was a wild goose chase for her family. By the time her family found out that she was in one location, she was with her godparent. Her godparent would move to another location, also looking for her family to try and reunify. So um, if, if you can remember during that time, technology wasn't as robust. And we, we seem to have gotten to the point where we're so reliant on technology to help resolve these issues that we often forget that uh, in a disaster, technology is one of the first things to go down. So although it could be a great solution down the line, during the initial impact phase of a disaster, we can't be completely reliant on it. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Nick Nick was actually, this was our foray into the disaster world. We were asked to provide support to Hurricane Katrina by um, our uh, by the Department of Justice because we do reunification on a day-to-day -day basis. So we initially stand, stood up a hotline to handle calls about missing children. So for the first several weeks, we got almost 35,000 calls. Um, and that hotline actually, post-Katrina, turned into what we now call the National Emergency Child Locator Center, which I'll talk about in a little bit. We also sent some of our um, field resources to help find missing children and family members and help to identify unaccompanied children in all of the various general population disasters that existed. So some of the challenges that really, when you try to break down what reunification really is, um, 
it's really just not a, a priority in emergency response operations, and I think, and especially in the emergency management world, and I think that a good majority of that is because of our reliance on technology, which we have to, you know, kind of way out because sometimes it, you know, technology, depending on the type of disaster, can really be a great resource. Um, but sometimes we can't, you know, just put 100 percent of our, um, our, our, we can't lean into it at 100 percent because it may not work. Um, and no matter how hard we try to promote the importance of family reunification planning or family emergency preparedness planning, um, many families still don't have a plan, or if they do have a plan, they don't practice it often enough for it to be socialized among the family members. And the same is true with schools and hospitals and child care and foster and congregate care programs and even camps and scout programs. We may have a plan, but we may not exercise it enough, or we, we may not even have a plan. So it's really important for us to include the element of reunification because any child-serving organization that is going to care for a child in the, in, the, uh, in the event that a disaster happens will also be responsible for starting the reunification process. Um, to make sure that that child is reunified with their family members as quickly as possible. Because in a disaster, we, we may not have, um, depending on where you are, you may, ha may not have the law enforcement resources that you typically deal with a missing child case. So it's important to have our own plans in place as a, as a redundancy mechanism. Part of the problem, as I mentioned earlier, is that you know, for we often get duplications of names, and I think that a big, a big part of that challenge is that there's no immediate messaging for parents on where to go or who to call to report missing persons. So that's the very first thing that should be done is messaging out to the parents. This is where you go. This is where you go to collect your kid. This is where you go to call in to report your child missing. Um, so that they are being directed and that information is being funneled to one centralized location. And then the, on the other side of that, there has to be a clearinghouse that is trained and has an effective uh, system to be able to intake the reports that are coming in. And that's how we could reduce that overinflation of missing persons reports. Um, we have to have a front-end process and a back-end process to make sure that that information is being funneled through effectively and that the reunification can be done quick, more quickly that way. Um, oftentimes, especially in the local jurisdiction level or even at the state level, there's really not an entity who can care for unaccompanied minors. I think schools and hospitals are the ones who often become overtaxed as the community caretakers in disasters. Um, I think that because we don't uh, have an entity to manage an unaccompanied child, so a, a child, again, who's found whose parents are missing, um, that oftentimes they may be dropped off at a school um, or they may be dropped off at a hospital so that it, it'll be the responsibility of these two entities to be able to reunify because they think they do it every day. And although they may do it every day, it's still in a disaster can become an overwhelming process. So. Um, I think that it's important to designate who that entity is, and that's why it's important that when Madeline put up that list of who the stakeholders should be, it's important to be able to invite your local emergency managers to the table so that that entity can be designated, whether it's social services or law enforcement or a whole community approach where it's a variety of different agencies who have background checked employees or volunteers, I think it's an important thing to uh, include in your planning effort. Um, I think that one of the other pieces that we learned during um, Hurricane Katrina is that regardless of how many unaccompanied children there are, whether it's one, ten, or a hundred, um, because you know, you've got to worry about their care. And then in some instances, you've got to worry about identifying who they are if they can't verbalize or they're unable to self-identify. Um, and then you work on the reunification. So it's really a much bigger effort than just um, taking in a report of a missing child and then starting your search. Um, and then the custodial rights was a big thing during Katrina. I think that um, hospitals deal with this a lot more often, but maybe um, schools also have to deal with this when, uh, when it's a person who comes that's not on the approved pickup list. Um, how do you determine custodial rights? especially in, in the aftermath of a disaster where the person may not have legal paperwork, but they're maybe the only surviving 
member left of the family, or um, there, you know, there's financial ties to having a larger family composition for federal money. Um, so all of a sudden, absentee parents may show up to pick up the kid, but it's really grandma who has legal custody of the kid, or or has non not not legal custody, but just takes care of the child. Um, so it's really, that's an important part to also add to your discussion, is how do you deal with custodial rights when it's someone who's not on a verified pickup list or someone who may not have um, the custodial authority to pick up the child? What, what is the process to manage that? And obviously privacy issues is also very important, which is something that also needs to be addressed, especially if it's um, children who uh, are, are taken to a hospital um, if they're injured, um, that, you know, obviously their status cannot be shared, but there are some waivers and provisions that can be uh, allowed to share basic um, privacy information for purposes of reunification. Um, if you Google that information, there's a lot of stuff that came out of Hurricane Katrina, um, and you can certainly reach out to me. I'm happy to share with you what, what we've de determined. Uh, and then we've also talked about like just all of the endangerments that a child who's separated from their family members are susceptible to, all sorts of trafficking issues. And trafficking is a, a big problem that's uh, on the rise in this country, and it happens on a day-to-day -day basis. And we also know that internationally it happens in a disaster. So uh, I think that it's safe to say that during a large-scale disaster here that we could potentially see children who are either recruited for trafficking or children who are already involved in trafficking that are um, trying to be sold or traded or um, tricked out uh, during a disaster. So it's really important that the entities that are involved in disasters um, are, are aware of the indicators or students that may show up to your school on a day-to-day -day basis, that there are indicators that you're aware of, that your um, school facilitators are aware of, um, they can pick up on that. And then the other piece that we're also trying to address, especially with the uh, disaster planners, are uh, children who are on the autism spectrum who have a tendency to wander from safe environments. I think that's an important factor um, to consider when you're planning because um, children who are in, obviously, who are on the autism spectrum um, may have a tendency to wander, especially if the environment is unfamiliar to them or overwhelming to them. And they also may have attractions to what we consider dangerous areas like high traffic areas or train tracks or large bodies of water. Um, so it's important to also put that into, take that into consideration when you're, when you're planning. Um, just to go really quickly through this, I think that some of the considerations um, that you can plan for are just identifying ways for um, the, the population to reunify themselves. So um, maybe in your school, if your school is uh, dealing with, um, you know, spotty connectivity, maybe having some kind of backup Wi-Fi system or hotspot system that will allow children who have cell phone technology to SMS text their family members because during a disaster, um, maybe SMS texting will work when uh, social or cell phone service or um, landlines may not. Um, you know, you want to maybe establish some type of reunification center to place around uh, to place around designated school routes um, to bring children to that location. Um, if there is a large number of unaccompanied children and the building is not safe, then um, designating another safe location to bring them to uh, under the uh, safety or protective custody of local authorities or school, te school teachers or school authorities. Um, Having come some kind of hotline or call center, and that can be tied into a larger, like a local jurisdiction call center. So maybe your county emergency manager has a call center, or the state may set up a call center if the disaster is big enough. Um, social media is big in trying to monitor what the disaster reunification needs. I know that a lot of disaster agencies start to track um, social media for purposes of identifying where the pockets are of people that are looking for other people and trying to make those matches happen. Um, and then also identifying the different state and national reunification partners um, as soon as possible. That's a really important piece of it because I think that in the immediate aftermath, it would be the local jurisdiction that would need to have those plans in place 
to take care of the first maybe 24 to 72 hours. And then in the aftermath of that, you know, standing up um, your state partners or your local or your national partners to come in and help address those efforts are really important. Now I just wanted to kind of go through some of the different reunification partners and resources at the national level that you can tap into. The National Center, we're a 501c3. Um, we've got, uh, we do this on a day-to-day -day basis. We help to reunify children. We work very closely with law enforcement and social services agencies, um, victims and family members of children who've, who've gone missing or have been abducted um, or who have been exploited. So this is, our, this is our bailiwick. This is what we do every day. So we have a lot of these disaster resources that we could, a lot of these day-to-day -day resources that we could apply in a disaster. Um, and I mentioned to you a little earlier about the National Emergency Child Locator Center, which is a call center that would stand up specifically at the request of the state. So if a school is getting, um, if there are many schools in the, in the state that, that are dealing with uh, reunification calls or uh, if there's a, a statewide disaster that nine, local 911 or 211 is dealing with a lot of calls but because pe parents cannot get to those schools. It may be wise for the state to request the national stands up, the national center stands up the National Emergency Child Locator Center. It is a uh, disaster call center that uh, has a dedicated line and specifically addresses child reunification needs. So children who are missing, children who are found, um, that's basically what we do. We also have field resources that could go out um, and help support reunification efforts, the first of which is Team Adam. Um, they are retired law enforcement professionals who bring years of experience with uh, missing children. Um, sorry, uh, that bring years of experience with missing children and um, unaccompanied, I mean, uh, search and rescue efforts and homicide investigations. So they could basically come and help law enforcement or whoever the designated entity is that's working on reunification um, to help with, uh, with, with reunifying that child. Project Alert also deals with the same issues, but they do more of the fatality side, so victim identification and things of that nature. And then we also have an unaccompanied minors registry, which um, is an online tool that could be very useful for any member, uh, any school agency or, or any member of the public who comes across an unaccompanied child who, um, who can basically uh, put in some basic information about the child, take a photo of the child, and the information goes directly and only to the National Center for purposes of doing two things. Number one, it helps us be aware that there's a child who's in need of, re of reunification. Um, and we would circle back with law enforcement on the ground to make sure that that child's in a safe location. But also, it helps us to cross-reference the information of that child against the parents of that child who are calling us to report that child missing. So it's just a way for us to expedite um, the reunification. Now I'm going to turn it over to Cindy so she can talk about the American Red Cross and the FEMA resources. Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to speak. In the interest of time, uh, I'm going to go through these pretty quickly. But from the federal perspective, um, we, we are an active participant in the planning and response to reunification uh, efforts on the national, regional, and uh, state and local level. American Red Cross is one of our uh, partners, um, and they deal with uh, adult reunification, they support the Safe and Well program, and um, they're an active partner in planning uh, along with uh, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children and our, and our other partners. They run the Safe and Well, um, and they also support the majority of emergency shelters following a disaster. And that's often where we get a lot of our information about separated family members, unaccompanied children, um, folks that have uh, dementia and not, are not able to speak for themselves. And, and uh, so we uh, share and coordinate that information in an effort to support reunification. Um, next slide. As far as FEMA is concerned on the, the national level, um, we have um, uh, as I mentioned, we're an active participant in 
uh, the planning and response efforts to reunification. And we have some reunification resources, the National Commission on Children in Disasters. Um, is a community of national child-serving organizations. And we also have uh, some online courses about planning for the needs in children in disasters. And then we also work with the pediatric community developing a disaster response. So uh, we also have the multi-agency reunification services planning template. Um, and then our post-disaster reunification of children. Uh, these provide frameworks for reunification planning, and uh, they're very useful tools. Also, uh, FEMA is able to provide technical, uh, technical assistance and support during planning. We call it blue skies, during blue skies. Um, and then we also. Uh, provide staff that uh, we can deploy to the field to provide uh, reunification support and subject matter expertise. Um, and most recently, we uh, stood up a task force in uh, Texas to work alongside with NECMEC, who's one of our strongest reunification partners. So um, I see the clock has three minutes left on it. So Paul, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, uh, Sharon and Sydney. So uh, we're actually going to move into the final section of today's events where you have the opportunity to pose questions to any of today's presenters. So as a reminder, to ask a question, use the Q&A box that's visible on your screen. You can also email us at info at remstacenter.org. And uh, we're going to start reviewing some of those questions now. So one question that we've had is, will the presentation slides be available for download? So the, uh, the streaming video and the presentation slides uh, will, be made, will be made available on the REMS TA Center's website uh, within the next, uh, probably the next seven to 10 days. Uh, so if you check back on that, you should be able to, uh, to, to gain access to those, to those slides there. Uh, you have a, a link to the webinars page on your screen, so you should be able to, uh, to click on that, and that will ultimately take you to, uh, to, to the place where that's going to be, uh, the information is going to be stored. Um, we've got some other questions that have come in here. I'm just having a quick look. Um, the first one I think I'm going to direct to Sharon. It seems to be the most appropriate. So uh, Sharon, one question we have is, uh, how do you activate NICMEX resources? Yes, great question. Um, so basically, the, the way that NICMIC is funded is we have a Department of Justice funding at the federal level, which allows us to provide those resources um, as long as that there is a state or federal request for those resources. So um, the, the Department of Ed, um, Emergency Management at the state level, Governor's Office, State Emergency Management, any, any of those entities at the state level could help push, those, push the activation of NICMIC resources. The one thing I did want to say is that the unaccompanied minors registry does not need to be activated. It is available for use at any time in the aftermath of a disaster. And I encourage all of you to um, actually go on the tool and play around with it. Um, it's umr.missingkids.org. It's on the uh, handouts. Um, and the resource guide, so you can actually go in and play around with it. But I do caution you that if you do utilize it, then please um, make sure that you're putting in test under first name or last name so that we know that it's not an active case because it is a live site. Great. Thanks, Sharon. And uh, another question, either for um, Sharon or Cindy. Uh, there's quite a few location tools that are available to the public after a disaster, such as Safe and Well and what's offered by Facebook and Google. Uh, how, do people, well, how do people choose which location tool to use, or how does the community uh, decide what tool to use? Sure. Uh, Cindy, I can take this if you want. Um, so yes, there are. 
There are a ton of different resources available for reunification, and you're not going to be able to control which ones are being used on the ground, but you can control which ones you choose to message to your constituent base, so whoever is part of your, um, in your uh, world. So it's the, the primary tools that we use, I think Cindy mentioned in, um, as part of the federal response, are Red Cross, Safe and Well, which is used for adult reunification. Um, and they have also a thing called emergency welfare inquiry that um, manages individuals with special needs or have medical concerns. And then the Unaccompanied Minors Registry and our National Emergency Child Locator Center are the two resources that we would use for children. Um, those are the best tools to be able to push out for people to use. But again, depending on the type of disaster, depending on whether connectivity works, Facebook may stand up, um, safety check for those people who have Facebook profiles, not everybody does, um, and Google Person Finder may stand up uh, an event on, on their website, but there are tons of other resources out there as well. Um, the only two that I would caution you to try and funnel through are the two that have been established at the national level um, that have been doing this for years and that know how to do this, and more importantly, that can talk to each other because there are contracts and partnerships in place, so we're sharing information. So if the National Center has an unaccompanied child and we're looking for the parents, we would talk to the Red Cross so that we can make that, that, um, that happen because the Red Cross may have information about their parents. So it's really important for us to be able to push Safe and Well and then the Unaccompanied Minors Registry and the National Emergency Child Locator Center out as primary resources. Great, thanks, Sharon. And uh, another question again, uh, Sharon or Cindy, uh, how familiar are emergency managers with the tools you described in your presentation? Uh, that's another great question. I don't mean to dominate the answers, but um, we have been doing a lot of socializing. Um, we've been working on a state level, very in-depth, um, on a state level, trying to get a lot of local jurisdictions involved in the conversation. The whole idea is for us to pull together a very comprehensive stakeholder group list. Um, so it's not literally just emergency managers sitting around the table planning, but they're pulling in the schools, they're pulling in hospitals, they're pulling in foster care, um, they're pulling in all of the necessary entities, even on the adult side, that need to help them plan for this in a comprehensive way. Um, so we're, we're working on socializing it. I know that we've been to many, many states. We still have a lot more to go, um, but we're, we're actually helping to try and um, push these resources into state emergency operations plans, and also help them develop templates for the local county level so that they're aware of all of the reunification resources that are available. So to piggyback on uh, what Sharon's saying from the federal uh, perspective, we reach out to our regional partners and, and work um, with, uh, we have 10 regions within FEMA, and we work with each of the regions and their state partners uh, to uh, also familiarize themselves with the resources and also help them with their emergency planning. And a lot of the things that you all are discussing today uh, about who should be part of this process and how does that communication work is uh, being developed uh, in coordination with our regional and state partners. So um, it's very familiar. And uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. And one of the things you mentioned earlier is about training and exercises. And that's one of the best ways to get all of the key stakeholders involved and, and uh, you know, provide input to your local emergency planning. Great. Uh, thanks, Sharon and Cindy. Um, Madeline, do you have any other comments um, that, to help address that question about how, um, how familiar emergency managers are with these tools? Sure. Thank you, Paul. Well, in regards to the alignment with the guidance for schools and guidance for emergency managers, um, they mirror one another. So they should be definitely should be familiar with the six-step planning process and um, things like that. But I encourage everyone if you haven't been contacted about this topic by your local emergency managers or your local municipality, and likewise at the state level, 
um, if you're an educational entity, I encourage you to reach out to your counterparts who would be addressing this topic. It's a wonderful, um, it's a wonderful opportunity not only to better protect the children before, during, and after um, an emergency, but it's going to have cascading and really positive ripple effects in terms of school preparedness and community preparedness, but most of all working together to ensure everyone's plans are comprehensive and you'll likely discover resources, additional resources that you can share. So, and we're also always a champion of every time we learn something new to integrate um, an action step so that the next day you can be stronger because of this webinar. So we encourage you to reach out and share these, um, these resources and perhaps together with your partners you can explore, learn, and plan better to protect your children. Great, thank you Madeline. Uh, we did have some additional questions come in, but uh, unfortunately we've run out of time at least during the, the webinar to address those. Uh, but we will be on the community of practice for about another half an hour to uh, answer any questions that do come in. And you can obviously continue to post questions after that half an hour and we'll respond to them accordingly. So uh, thank you to everyone who's posed a question and a special thanks goes to our presenters, Cindy Atkins from FEMA and uh, Sharon Hawa from uh, the NICMIC. They provided their contact information in the presentation, but you can also contact them by emailing the REMS TA Center and forward your request to the appropriate person. Thank you also for participating in this webinar. An archive will be available on the REMS TA Center site within seven to 10 business days, along with the resource list. And you can continue to connect and collaborate with us in a variety of ways, including through our toll-free phone line and info at remstacenter.org. And be sure to find us on Twitter for daily updates on TA Center activities and important information and services from our collaborative partners. Finally, as I just mentioned, we've started a new forum on our community of practice to discuss today's topics in more detail, where we encourage you to pose questions to today's presenters, the OSHS REMS team, and your colleagues to share resources. You'll be automatically forwarded to the COP when this webinar ends. If not, first log into the community of practice and you can find the login button at the top of our website and the web links box on your screen. Once you've logged in, click the K-12 public forums, then the reunification forum, and finally the post-disaster reunification web chat post. Again, if you have any issues accessing the forum, feel free to email us at info at remstacenter.org. We'll be live on the COP for about 30 minutes to address any additional questions you have, including the ones that we haven't got to so far, and to hear any additional insight that you have to share about emergency preparedness and reunification after a community-wide disaster. Thank you for your time today, and this concludes the webinar. <laughs>